Well, hello there. So today we're going to look at some aspects of circuit analysis that will lead up to equivalent circuits. So we're going to start off with linearity. Um, nearly all the circuits we will study in this class are linear circuits, and that means that the output is proportional to the input. So if you double one of the inputs, you get double of the output. So all of our resistors, sources, capacitors, inductors, we're assuming those are linear systems. And this simplifies a lot of the circuit analysis. One of the things you get with a linear system is you can use superposition to solve the circuit. And this is an analysis technique that it's you have to still use node and mesh analysis, but it lets you simplify the circuit in order to have a, an easier system to solve. The trade-off is that you have to solve an easier system many times. So the theorem says if a circuit contains more than one source, so current sources or voltage sources, the things you calculate, either voltages or currents in the circuit, are equal to the sum of the individual responses associated with the individual independent sources as if each had been acting alone. So what you do if you have three voltage sources and two current sources or something like that, that's how many sources you have, you can redraw the circuit with just one source, solve it, save that answer, redraw the circuit with the second source, solve it, and so forth, and then you add up all the things at the end. So the steps are to set all of the sources equal to zero except for the first one. When we set it to zero, for voltage sources, we want zero volts. So we'll see this in a second, but zero volts means a short circuit. For current sources, we want zero amps. So when we zero the sources, for zero amps, we have to make an open circuit. So then we analyze the circuit, and then we repeat. So you get, instead of one complicated circuit, you get n easier circuits. So it doesn't usually pay off, but it's really useful for certain theorems and proofs, and every once in a while it's very handy. Here's an example of using superposition to solve for this circuit here. Um, this circuit has two sources, a current source and a voltage source. And so the trick with superposition is we do one source at a time. So we, we analyze this circuit twice because there are two sources. So the first one on the left down here, we're going to zero the voltage source by replacing it with a short circuit. So we replace it with a wire. So if you measured across these terminals with a wire here, we'll measure zero volts. And we solve for this circuit. We're looking for this current I here. So we can do this with mesh or node analysis, however you like. We'll find I1 is 2 amps. Then we have to do it for the other source and for every other source in the circuit. So we zero this current source and we'll just leave this one and zero everything else. So to make this current source go to zero we replace it with an open circuit. So I've drawn the little dangling wires here just to show that, that it's taken out. And we have just one source at a time. Again, we solve for the current that we're interested in. This time negative three amps from this voltage source. And then once we've done it for every source, we add them together. So the total current in the original circuit is the sum of the currents we found for each individual analysis. So that's how you can use superposition. Usually it's a little slower, I think, overall, since it's not too hard to analyze this one from scratch. But it can be handy in proofs. Like I said, it shows up in some theorems later. Um, it's also useful if you are only changing one thing. Maybe in your company you'll be analyzing the same product over and over, and you may be changing just one part at a time. So you can save all of your old analyses and just see how it changes with a new thing using superposition. Okay, so superposition is one of the really key parts that lets us do equivalent circuits. And so leading up to that, we're just thinking about how we model circuits. So this is a picture from our book of the pieces in a cell phone. So it's a complicated thing and you don't have to understand how it all works, but you can see that pieces are divided into these blocks. 
So we have block diagrams with the RF low noise amp, the IF amps, modulator, demodulator, microprocessors, and lots of other things. So all of these little blocks are a circuit, set of circuits, and we can combine them together to make a whole thing like a cell phone. So being able to simplify a circuit into a simple block diagram is a really useful thing that is done all the time. So with linear circuits, we can have some powerful theorems to show how we can simplify things. So here we've got a voltage source and an impedance, which is like a resistance, but a little more general, and we'll get to that in the next section. Um, we've got an amplifier here, and we put boxes around everything to make them into blocks. And then we have connecting wires, connecting them to terminals here. So this is kind of the geography of where we're going to try to move all of our circuits into for equivalent circuits. Equivalent circuits are also useful when you can't model something. Usually we think of, as we'll see, we do equivalent circuits of something made with a bunch of linear components like resistors and sources and, and so forth, and we simplify it reduce the parts count, that's a useful thing to do. But sometimes it's not so easy to figure out how to, to model something. So something like a car battery, it's not, you know, it's got plates and acid and chemistry and things going on. So how do you model that in terms of a schematic? One thing you might do is just use a voltage source because it's a 12 volt battery, 12 volt voltage source. So voltage source is a pretty good starting point for a battery. But if you've driven a car, if you've tried to start your car with the headlights on, when you're cranking the engine, the headlights drop because all of the current going into the starter motor, there isn't as much power left for the, for the headlights. The voltage drops. And an ideal voltage source doesn't matter how much current is going out. But if we add a resistor in series with an ideal voltage source, then we get that same effect where with low loads, we'll have 12 volts, but then if we draw a lot of current from our source, the voltage will drop because of this resistor in here. So if you add a resistor in series to a battery, that's a pretty good model for a battery. So these model ideas let us take something really complicated like a battery, where you'd have to be a good physicist in order to come up with, with the model, and do a couple of experiments and find something very useful. Okay, so the two equivalent circuits that we will talk about in this class are Thevenin equivalent circuit and Norton equivalent circuit. Thevenin is the more common one. And what Thevenin's theorem says is that any circuit, any linear two terminal circuit, so we have circuits inside of here and two terminals means two wires coming out. We can replace that circuit with a circuit that's just a single voltage source and a single resistor in series. So complicated circuit on the top simplifies down to this. And so then the next step is how do we solve for that? So uh, the, the first part is actually here. If we put a voltmeter across the terminals, we should get the Thevenin voltage, VTH for Thevenin here. And resistance we'll see in a second in the next video. The Norton equivalent is where we take an actual original circuit with two terminals and we replace it with a current source and a resistor in parallel. So here's the Thevenin again, a voltage source and a resistor in series. Here's the Norton with a current source and a resistor in parallel. And you can take any complicated linear circuit and make it into this one or into this one. And in fact, if you have one or the other of the equivalents, it's very fast to change, either using the rules or just Ohm's law here. Norton current is Thevenin voltage divided by Thevenin resistance, and the resistors are the same value in both equivalent circuits. So if you find the Thevenin, you can easily convert to the Norton. If you have the Norton, I and R, it's the same R, and you can calculate the Thevenin voltage using this equation too. So the next 
lecture will go into step-by-step -step process of finding these equivalent circuits for any two-terminal circuit. It's going to rely on our node and mesh analysis skills that we've been working on, so hopefully you are uh, up to date on that. If not, you can review those videos, um, and it's a good review of node and mesh analysis, which is why we're doing it now. So I'll see you in the next video with some Thevenin and Norton equivalent circuit work.